So any uh, questions or thoughts on people's minds uh, on anything we've been discussing? Yes, we all want to know what's going to be in the midterm. <laughs> the midterm, ah, uh -huh. when is the midterm? <laughs> it's Friday, <laughs> Friday of next week. Oh, plenty of time to discuss yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, we should be doing, on Friday of this week, we should be doing a review class, uh, if that works. Great. That sounds like a good idea. Okay. It's been a lot of it's been a lot of fun, Tony. You're doing you all, are, uh, Jeff and Tony, you're doing a great job. Thank you. Oh, thank well, we're we're enjoying it. I hope uh, you're finding it interesting. I'm finding it interesting thinking about economics this way. So uh, it's it's a good uh, good deal. I find it amazing that the, there are so few numbers involved. You once mentioned the Cobb-Douglas function, but other than that, you've been very self-controlled. <laughs> All right, well, we're, we're going to have more Cobb-Douglas functions today. <laughs> so I hope I don't lose the self-control. <laughs> we, we've been uh, talking about, uh, we talked about uh, pro-sociality and anti-sociality. We talked about uh, theories of government last time. Is government for the good? Uh, is it uh, is it a necessary evil? Is it a way to achieve collective action? Is it a way to achieve fairness? And today I want to talk about what is the normal focus of mainstream economics, which is uh, the market economy. Uh, the market economy means uh, the way that individuals interact and businesses interact uh, with their private property, uh, how uh, businesses uh, hire labor, produce output, sell goods to the marketplace, how individuals uh, uh, choose to uh, choose uh, their place of employment uh, in a market system, uh, how land use is allocated if land is privately owned rather than owned by the government. And the usual treatment of the uh, market system in economics is the idea that the market system dominates uh, how we produce and use commodities. Government is uh, viewed as the secondary cleanup act, if that. Sometimes it's uh, almost put to the side because uh, in the mainstream uh, economic ideas, markets are very attractive. Uh, the idea is that when people own their private property, they have freedom to choose. Uh, they can uh, decide on uh, what they want to buy, uh, where they want to work, how much they want to work. They can meet their individual preferences head on without some bureaucrat telling them what to do. Uh, they can take their ideas, and if they are good ideas uh, that are of value to others, they'll make money uh, by uh, starting up businesses and so forth. All of that has some merit. Uh, countries that have tried to operate without markets uh, have found that uh, economies uh, fail when all markets are stopped. Of course, one of our themes is that the role of the market in a well-functioning society is uh, a limited role. It's not the dominant role, and it's not the guiding a mechanism for how resources uh, are used and shared across the population because the market system can have some very untoward uh, effects. Uh, it can produce vast suffering uh, for people who uh, don't earn enough uh, in the marketplace to sustain a decent life. It can lead to many kinds of destructive practices, many kinds of so-called market failures, 
like pollution <laughs> or monopoly power or fraud or other kinds of abuses. Today, I want to start with the some general ideas about uh, the market and emphasize the difference between uh, efficiency and fairness. Markets are often pretty good at efficiency. They're very rarely good at fairness. Uh, they're not designed for fairness, they're designed for profit. And that does not uh, by itself uh, lead to uh, fairness. And so I want to distinguish uh, efficiency and equity and make some observations about the role of the markets and the limit of the markets in that context. Next week, we'll talk about other kinds of failures of the marketplace, uh, failures uh, that lead to environmental destruction, failures that lead to fraud, failures that lead to monopoly power and its consequent abuses and high cost to society. So today I'll put aside many of those problems of the market and just go to a few core ideas about what the market does and what it does not do. So let me uh, start us off by uh, <coughs> turning to uh, the PowerPoint um, and so today's uh, topic is how markets work. What do they do? And I'm going to give just a few simple examples because, of course, uh, this is a topic that can be viewed in great detail over many, many weeks. But since we're talking about so many interesting topics of which markets are just one, <laughs> we're going to compress this discussion into uh, really uh, just a few lectures starting here. And I'm going to start with an example <coughs> that's very pertinent in American society today. And that is how the labor market works. Uh, and I'm going to study that by considering two groups of workers, also uh, in, uh, empirically very relevant distinction. I'm going to talk about workers that have a college degree or higher. Uh, and I'm going to denote workers with a capital L, that stands for labor, uh, and the subscript C means college degree. And I'm going to contrast that with workers with a high school diploma or, or less, and I'll call that L subscript H. And just for clarity, I'm going to give a numerical example that there are, are a thousand workers in this economy that have a high school diploma and 500 workers that have a college diploma. That's about right for the American adult population. Roughly 35% of the American adult population has a bachelor's degree or higher and two thirds have less than a bachelor's degree. And this division is a major division in the labor market and in incomes of households across the society. So when we talk about how markets function, we have a, a theory of how business firms operate and how business firms decide on uh, how many workers they want to hire and what they will produce. And so the way that this is usually formulated is to imagine an engineering function, which we call the production function, which measures the firm's output, which I'll call Q, as determined by the inputs to production used by the firm. And in this business, we'll consider three kinds of inputs. Uh, workers with a high school education, workers with a college education, and the capital stock. The capital stock would mean in this context, things like the factory building, the uh, trucks and uh, uh, other vehicles owned by the company, 
the machinery of the company. And in practice, it would also mean the uh, intangible uh, capital of the company, ownership of patents or other knowledge kinds of goods, copyright materials and so forth. So the capital are assets that are productive, uh, that uh, uh, work alongside labor to produce the output uh, of this company or of this sector, or in this case of the economy as a whole. So we start with the production function and that production function is a Cobb Douglas production function. Uh, each input is taken to a given power and exponent. So it's uh, high school workers to the exponent A times college workers to the exponent B times the capital stock to the exponent one minus A minus B. If you add up those exponents, they add up to one. That is a useful feature uh, of this production function because it says if you double the number of high school educated workers, the number of college educated workers and the amount of capital, the factory buildings, the vehicles, the patents and so forth. If you double all of those inputs, you double the output, what's called constant returns to scale. If you triple the inputs, you triple the output and so on. And that's because the coefficients of this production function sum to one. So to understand how markets function, we look at the behavior of each uh, actor in the economy. It could be the factory owner or manager working on behalf of the capital owners of the company. It could be the workers, it could be the consumers and so on. In this very simplified uh, model of an economy where there's just one kind of output Q, we won't worry too much about what consumers do. Uh, we're just going to ask a basic question. How will the factory owner uh, decide how many workers to hire? And the answer is that the factory owner wants to maximize the profits of the company. And what are the profits of the company? The profits of the company are the output of the company minus the cost of the high school educated workers, the payroll, minus the payroll of the college educated workers. And the payroll is the number of workers times the wage that that kind of worker earns. So the wage of a high school educated worker is given by W subscript H. The wage of a college educated worker is given by W subscript C. And you may uh, notice that I've said that uh, the profits are equal to Q minus the payroll. Q is both the output and the revenues because I've snuck in the assumption that the price of this good is just equal to one. I've normalized the price, setting the price of the good as equal to one. Uh, that means that the wage level is the uh, number of units of output that the worker can buy with the earnings uh, that the worker makes uh, in the form of wages. So the factory owner wants to maximize profits. And we have now the expression for profits. And we ask how many workers of each kind should this factory owner higher in order to maximize profits. And the way that uh, we can do this uh, is a little bit of calculus snuck in here, but it basically asks uh, a question, which is suppose that there's a given workforce and the uh, owner decides I'll hire one more high school educated worker. And then the question is, will that raise profits or not raise profits? So to find that out, you ask how much output 
additional output will there be if I hire one more high school educated worker? Well, that is delta Q is the increment of output that comes from the added worker. And that equals uh, this expression, uh, A times uh, LH to the power A minus one, LC to the power B, K to the power one minus A minus B times the increment of high school workers. How did I get that? Uh, that is the derivative of the uh, production function with respect to LH. So if I take the derivative of this uh, production function with respect to the uh, uh, input of high school educated workers, that is a partial derivative. I get, if you recall from calculus, uh, when you take the exponent of, uh, when you take the uh, derivative of uh, a function x to the a, that is a times x to the power a minus one times the rest of the expression. And that's what I have put here. So the increment of output is equal to the increment of labor times this expression. So we can say that the marginal product of a high school educated worker is the change of output per change of worker. And that gives me uh, <clears throat> the expression at the bottom of this slide. That's just taking a partial derivative of the production function. Now, why does that matter? Because, uh, and I can do the same thing, I should say, with college educated workers, and I get a, uh, an expression that is almost the same. Now, the reason that that matters is that if the factory owner wants to maximize profits, the value of the increased output has to be higher than the incre than the cost of that incremental worker. And so that's true as long as the marginal product of the worker is higher than the wage of the worker. If the extra output exceeds in value the wage of that extra worker, hire the worker. If the value of the extra output is less than the wage that you'd have to pay that extra worker, don't hire the worker. And so the factory owner hires LH and LC as long as the marginal products of high school educated workers and the marginal products of college educated workers exceeds their respective wages. And the firm will continue to hire these workers of each kind until the incremental output of each kind of worker just equals the wage of that kind of worker. And so we end up with an expression that tells us that the firm will hire high school educated workers to the point where the wage equals the marginal product of high school educated workers and the wage of the college worker will equal the marginal product of the college worker. And we have these two algebraic expressions. But lo and behold, uh, we know all of the values uh, that go into that expression so we can calculate the wage for a given amount of employment, or if I shift the form of the equation, the amount of employment for any given wage. So I can rewrite these expressions which come from profit maximization by 
the company. I can rewrite each of those expressions just uh, putting in the top formula, I put uh, the amount of uh, high school educated labor on one side of the equation and move all the rest of the variables to the other side. And in the bottom expression, I put the amount of college uh, workers hired by the company on one side of the equation and move all the expressions to the other side. And when I do that, I get a big algebraic expression that expresses the amount of workers that the company will hire depending on the wage. And we get these two formulas. So LH is a negative function of the wage level. The higher the wage, the fewer the workers because uh, extra workers won't uh, produce enough to uh, merit that higher wage. So the demand for labor is a negative function of the wage level of that kind of worker. I can graph these uh, equations in the following way. If I ask how many workers will this company hire at different wage levels? The wage is shown on the vertical axis and on the horizontal axis is the number of workers that the uh, economy would hire of that kind. So for example, if the wage is 0.2, that could be, uh, what could that mean? That could mean if this was in units of a thousand, it could mean $200 a week, say. Uh, you look across uh, from the wage level on the vertical axis and at 0.2, uh, the demand for labor is 2,000 workers. If instead the wage level is uh, 0.1, ah, then the company is going to hire a lot more workers. It's going to be more than 5,000 employees because the wage is less and it therefore is profit maximizing to hire more workers. So we get a demand for labor as a function of the wage of that kind of labor. And to find out the actual wage in the economy, what we have to do is to put the demand for labor, which is the downward sloping line, with the supply of labor. What is the supply of labor? It's the number of workers in the economy of a certain type, in this case of high school educated level. So if there are a thousand high school educated workers in the economy, and if hiring is based on profit maximization, then it turns out that the supply of workers 1000 and the demand for workers 1000 will occur when the wage is at 0 0.32. So by combining the demand for labor and the supply of that kind of labor, we can find out the wage of a high school worker in this case. And that's shown by the equality of, or the, the equilibrium point, the meeting point of the demand curve, the downward sloping demand curve. And in this case, the vertical line, which is the supply of labor, that there are a thousand workers of this kind. What happens if more relatively low skilled workers come into the economy, say there's immigration, for example, and these are uh, migrants of high school 
degree, then according to the labor demand, all those new uh, migrants or population increase uh, between a generation would be hired, but at a lower wage. The wage would have to be lower so that the businesses decide that it's worthwhile to hire all of those extra workers. So in this example, if I say that the 1,000 high school level workers becomes 2,000 high school level workers, the wage falls from about 0.32 to about 0.2. You could say that the increased supply of high school educated workers drives down the wage. Or you could say that the wage falls to the point where the increased supply of labor is equal by the increased demand by businesses for that kind of labor. So this is how we use the supply and the demand uh, curves to find the market wage in the economy. We could say the market system, by having a number of businesses hiring workers and a number of workers looking for work, results in a market-determined wage level. And that wage level is the level of wages so that the number of workers that the firms desire equals the number of workers looking for work. You get a market equilibrium. So let's plug in some numbers as I've already started to do. We have a production function and we need exponent values. So I'm putting A equals 0.3, B equals 0.4. I'm saying that high school educated workers is 500. College educated workers is uh, 1,000. I have that backwards. Uh, that should be, oops, sorry. Anyway, I have those numbers reversed. Uh, it should be high school is 1,000, college is 500, and the capital stock is 1,500. And when I use these uh, uh, illustrative numbers, I find that the wage for a high school educated worker is 2.26. The wage for a college educated worker is more than twice that is 0.68 and the total output in the economy is 856, okay? That's a, just applying a specific set of numbers to this specific production function and assuming that the wages of the high school and college educated workers are determined for full employment of each kind of worker. Okay, now what happens if some of the high school workers go on to college. So instead of having a uh, 1,000 high school workers, we now have 750. And instead of having 500 college educated workers, we now have 750. So 250 of the high school workers have gone to college. Well, we can then use the same set of equations to ask what would be the new equilibrium of wages and the new output. And in this case, uh, the wages of the high school uh, workers would go up from what it was before. Instead of being 0.32, it's now 0.37. The wages of the college educated workers would go down Remember that before it was 0.68, now it's 0.49. So since there are fewer high school workers, their relative wage goes up. Since there are more college workers competing for uh, jobs, their wage goes down. And the total output in the economy, in this case, which had been 856, also rises. 
So there's economic growth if there's more education and more education narrows the income inequality because in the earlier case where there were many more high school educated workers than college workers, the college workers were receiving a scarcity premium. Their wage was high because their relative number was few. But as the number of college educated workers rises and the number of high school educated workers declines, the scarcity of the college workers diminishes and so does their wage. And the scarcity of the high school educated workers rises and so therefore does their wage as well. And in this case, output also rises. Okay, let's try a different experiment because this I think is interesting and relevant. Suppose that we go back to the original workforce a thousand high school educated workers, 500 college educated workers. But now we assume that the technology changes. I'm gonna assume that the economy becomes more capital intensive, more automated, uh, that there's a higher uh, usage of capital goods in the production process. And a simple way to do that is to go back to our production function. Remember this, oops, this one. And what I'm going to do is raise the coefficient on capital. So capital is going to play a more important role in production. And I'm going to lower the coefficient on high school educated workers. That's a pretty reasonable uh, uh, description of how the economy works because as the capital becomes uh, uh, more sophisticated, for example, robotics, the robots take over more of the production process on the assembly line and the high school educated workers take on a smaller role. So if I assume that the coefficient A goes down, and therefore the coefficient on the capital, uh, the, or I should say the exponent of high school educated workers goes down and the exponent on the capital stock goes up. That's like saying that the economy becomes more capital intensive at the expense of the less educated workers. In effect, they're being replaced by automation. And if we go through that experiment now, and it's a simple experiment, A, the exponent declines from 0.3 to 0.2, the exponent on college workers stays the same, and the exponent on the capital stock rises from 0.3 to 0.4, it equals one minus A minus B. What happens? Well, this is interesting. What happens is if we compare the new situation with the situation before automation, what we'll find out is that the automation, let's go back to where it was, uh, before the automation, the wage of the high school worker was 0.26. Now what is it? It's 0.18. So the high school wage has gone down because the number of workers demanded for the assembly line has gone down because the company is using more robots now and fewer high school educated workers on the assembly line. What about uh, what happens to the returns to skilled work? It was The wage was 0.68. Now in the new situation, the wage is 0.71. And what happens to output? Output is now 891 and it used to be 856. Okay, so output has gone up, college earnings have gone up, high school earnings have gone down. This is a very interesting outcome. It says that if the economy becomes more automated or more capital intensive, the illustration shows that that leads to higher output in the economy. 
but it worsens the position of the high school educated worker and it improves the position of the college educated worker. We can also ask, what does it do to the return to capital? Because I haven't talked about the profits yet. What is the uh, return to capital? That's the equivalent to the wage that's earned by the labor, but this is the return earned by the 1,500 units of capital. Well, there's an equation for the returns to capital as well. And when I uh, make this uh, change from uh, A equals 0.3 to the more automated economy, A equals 0.2, it turns out that R, the return to capital, goes way up from 0.17 to 0.27. Similarly, when more high school educated workers become college educated, the returns to capital also go up from uh, 0.17 to 0.18. Conclusion. Okay, the conclusion is that if the economy and this is a conclusion of, of an example, it's not a proof, but it's an example of an economy that's becoming more automated. And the kind of automation is that uh, it's affecting the lower skilled workers more than the higher skilled workers. So what we call, uh, we could call it capital skill complementarity, that the capital becomes better, that doesn't, hurt the skilled workers, but it does hurt the unskilled workers who are replaced by these improved machines. And what the example shows, which is very, very important, is that if the economy becomes more automated, the wage of the high school worker goes down, but the total output of the economy goes up, and both the skilled workers and the, uh, and, and the capital owners are better off. Think about the United States for a moment. We've been having technological change for the last 40 years that has been smarter and smarter robots. And if you go to a factory now, and I have done this on many occasions, Sometimes you go to a factory where there are almost no workers in the factory anymore. Uh, you can see a large auto assembly plant that it's all robotic arms and robotic uh, vehicles uh, taking uh, parts and components from one station to another. And maybe a few workmen sitting to make sure the machine doesn't break down, but actually doing uh, little other than supervision. And that's very different from what an assembly line looked like 40 years ago. So what's happened in this economy over the last 40 years? The machines got smarter. The production became more capital intensive. If you look at the GDP of the economy, which measures the output, that's like Q in this example. Output has gone up. But does everybody feel good? Well, not quite. Uh, if you are a capital owner, if you have a lot of stock, so you own the company, great, profits have soared. If you have a college degree, so that you're not being replaced by the robots, but you're working alongside them because you're doing design or marketing or something else, but not assembly line work, great, our company's more productive. If you are an assembly line worker, hell, what just happened? I lost my job. And the wage has gone down because to uh, have me hired, the businesses are now only willing to pay a smaller amount because my marginal productivity has declined. So this is not a bad description of what has happened to the US economy over the last 40 years. And it shows that a market system can be very productive 
you can have economic growth, but it doesn't mean that everybody is benefiting. Some classes can benefit and others can be absolutely impoverished. And in the United States, the wages of college educated and especially professional and advanced degree holders has gone up a lot in the last 40 years, but the wages of assembly line workers and in general workers with a high school diploma or less has been stagnant or declining. And that has led to a political backlash also. Uh, a lot of this has been blamed in recent years in the United States on China. They stole our jobs. It's not quite true. Actually, we have a lot of job creation in the United States over the last 30 years, but at lower wages for the less uh, lower levels of educational attainment. And it isn't really China that took the jobs away. It is technological change that has favored certain groups of people in the society, especially those with uh, more professional training or higher skills or not competing directly with the robots as of yet, uh, compared to those who have been in the front line of competition with the new automation. But the point is that a market system raises output much more predictably than it allocates that increased output on a shared basis. There was a, an expression uh, once uh, stated by my favorite president, John F. Kennedy, uh, who said a rising tide lifts all boats. But in a market system, it's not true, except under very particular conditions that a rising tide lifts all boats. A rising tide can sink some boats uh, and it can uh, raise the uh, remainder of the boats. And in the US market system in the last 40 years, it has sunk the boats of those with lower educational levels uh, and definitely raised those with uh, uh, more professional training. And that's led to an unprecedented degree of inequality in uh, the earnings in the US population. So let me see if I can go back and find where we were. I think it's here. Uh, let me give you another example. So uh, similar to before, I'm going to assume a new kind of production function, a little more algebra. So now output is again a function of unskilled labor and skilled labor. That's like high school and college, but I'll use different terms. And the capital stock. And I'm going to write it in a different way because I have an idea that I want to show you. So this is another example. In this example, output is determined by the sum of two processes. It's determined by the inputs of skilled labor in a linear way, M times skilled labor. And it's determined by unskilled labor and capital working together, for example, on the assembly line. And the total output is the sum of these two processes. And I want to ask the question, uh, what happens uh, in this economy when some of the unskilled workers become skilled workers? So I'm going to give another long uh, illustration. Uh, suppose that the capital, st capital stock is 1,000 in the economy and I give a coefficient, uh, the exponent A, I put it 0.3, and I set M equals one. This is just a numerical illustration. And I suppose that there are a thousand unskilled workers and 500 skilled workers. And I do exactly <coughs> what I did before. I can determine the demand for labor. And when I do so, I find that the unskilled wage will be 0.4, and the skilled wage will be one, two and a half times higher. 
the return to capital, 0.62, and the total output, 1,828. Now, that's the beginning. Suppose that some of the unskilled workers become skilled workers. What happens? Well, the unskilled wage rises because there's more scarcity of the unskilled worker. The wage goes from 0.4 to 0.49. The wage of the skilled worker stays the same. The earnings of the capitalist go down and the output goes up. Oh, so the economy grows. Many unskilled workers see their wage double, more than double, and those who remain unskilled have a higher wage than they did before. The wage of the skilled worker stays the same, and the wage of the capitalist goes down a little bit. Why does the return to capital go down when there is less unskilled work to hire? Well, you can see that the capitalist uh, makes profits by hiring unskilled workers to work with the capital stock. But if there are fewer unskilled workers, then the productivity of the capital stock is going to be less. So in this economy, the capitalist who owns K wants there to be lots and lots of unskilled workers to hire to work with the capital machinery. But if those unskilled workers get trained and they go off and they work on their own as skilled workers, not working together with K, well, the benefits of owning capital diminish, though the returns to skilled work are higher. So why do I give this example? Because uh, it's quite interesting in American history. Uh, if you start with the situation of lots of unskilled workers and you ask, do the skilled workers and the capitalists favor job training for the unskilled workers? Well, definitely the capitalists don't like it. Uh, they don't want the unskilled workers to get trained because then they go away and they work on their own instead of working in the factory. The skilled workers don't really care so much uh, in this example, but their uh, relative income compared to the unskilled worker has, has shrunken. Uh, and so uh, they're not as high in relative income as they were before. So suppose that the skilled workers and the capitalists could get together to determine whether or not there are schools and job training for the unskilled workers. What would they say? Well, they'd actually conspire to say to the unskilled workers, sorry, you can't go to school. You should work in the factory. That's going to be better for all of us, except for you, <laughs> but it's going to be better for the rest of us, for the existing skilled workers, and for the capital owners. And I think that this is not a uh, bad representation of how our racism has worked in US society, especially how it worked, for example, in the US South after the Civil War, when the slave population was freed, the uh, white skilled workers and the white capitalists who were actually were landowners rather than capital owners, denied education to the freed slaves because the capital owners, in this case landowners, wanted the uh, workers to remain as unskilled workers on their plantations. The skilled workers didn't want the competition from the newly freed slaves, uh, former slaves as well. And 
if you think about this in political terms, not in market terms, uh, the skilled workers and the capitalists said better that the unskilled worker remains unskilled. That's less competition for us and more of a guaranteed input for our labor force. And so you can see that the market equilibrium also leads to a political outcome in certain cases. If you can deny skills to a certain group, that may be to the advantage of others in the society. It's a form of direct oppression, of course, because the unskilled worker benefits directly by going uh, and getting higher skills. But those who already have the higher skills or, or who own the capital will resist that kind of improvement. And we see throughout economic history exactly this kind of behavior, incredibly nasty uh, and incredibly uh, cynical, when imperial uh, powers took over other countries, when the British ruled India, uh, or when uh, the British and the French and the Italians and the Germans colonized Africa, they were uninterested in providing education to the workforce because the unskilled, untrained workforce did the work on the farms or in the mines and did not compete with the skilled workers and by being available in massive numbers provided the inputs to work along with the machines or along with the land as it were. And so the market does not uh, fairly uh, distribute income. And it can be the case also that groups gang up even to keep output from rising at, because stopping the training lowers total output of the economy, but it does improve the position of two classes in the society, but it very much exploits the remaining class, in this case, the unskilled worker. So again, the market system uh, by itself raises income, but shifts income distribution. And it can shift income distribution favorably, but then be stopped by uh, dominant class interests, or it may shift income distribution to create even wider inequality and then not even be noticed or acknowledged by the uh, upper classes. And I, I think that that is more true of what's happened in American society during the last 40 years. Let me give a little bit more uh, meat to this uh, by turning to meat production for one moment, uh, another simple thought experiment. So this is a different kind of uh, thought experiment. Suppose there are two kinds of land in a rural economy. One kind of land is very good for growing grain crops. Uh, I'll call it corn or maize. Uh, not so good for having uh, cattle ranching. And then the other kind is pasture land that is very good for cattle ranching, for example, but not so good for growing a crop. Uh, it probably is too dry, for example, to grow a crop. So in this simple example, suppose that each hectare of land uh, is a uh, a hectare, remember, is 100 meters by 100 meters square. Uh, and uh, each hectare uh, of land can grow two tons of corn per year and can raise one ton of beef per year if it's cropland. And if it's pasture land, it's the inverse. Uh, pasture land, you can grow one ton of maize or, or corn per year or two tons of beef uh, per year. And we'll consider an economy in this case of smallholder farmers. 
each smallholder farmer has three hectares of land. And I want to consider two simple cases. One is where each farm family lives on its own, grows food for its own use, and uh, operates autarkically, self-sufficiently. And the other where the crop farmers trade with the cattle farmers on the pasture land. So let's take the autarkic case first, where each of these farm families lives on its own. And I'll assume that each farm family wants to eat an equal portion of corn and beef during the year. Okay. Well, how would you do that if you were a crop farmer? You want to end up with the most corn and beef, but of an equal quantity. Well, clearly what you would do is you would devote uh, two hectares of land to beef, uh, to cattle uh, growing, uh, cattle rearing, and one hectare to corn, and you would end up with two tons of beef and two tons of corn. And the pasture land, you would do the reverse. You would take two of your hectares and grow corn on those hectares, and you would take one hectare of land and raise one uh, and uh, raise uh, um, two tons of beef on that one hectare. So by allocating your land in either case, both types of farmers end up with two tons of corn and two tons of beef for the year. In the croplands, most of the land is devoted actually to beef. And in the pasture lands, most is devoted to corn. Seems odd, but that's because the families want an equally balanced diet between the two kinds of food production. So the cropland farm families end up with two tons of corn and two tons of beef, and the pasture land farm families end up also with two tons of corn and two tons of beef. Now, obviously, what if they could trade with each other instead of dividing their farms for the two purposes? Well, you can see intuitively, I'm sure, that in this case, it would be good for all three hectares of cropland to be devoted to corn and all three hectares of pasture land to be devoted to beef. How many tons of corn would be produced? Six on the cropland. How many tons of beef would be produced? Six on the pasture land. And suppose that the crop farmer trades three tons of corn for three tons of beef. Then by trading with each other, each farm family would end up with three tons of corn and three tons of beef. Okay, very important point. What has happened? What has happened is that if instead of autarky, these two different farm systems can trade with each other, then there is the benefit of specialization. Each one specializes in the agricultural type for which their land has a comparative or relative advantage. So the pasture land farmer becomes all corn growing. I'm sorry, uh, the pasture land farmer becomes all cattle ranching. The uh, farmland, uh, cropland farmer becomes all corn growing, and then they trade with each other. So trade allows for specialization. Without trade, you have to do everything on your own. Uh, without trade, you have to devote some of your land to corn, some to beef. But with trade, you have the advantage. Specialize in the thing you're really good at and trade for the commodity that you are not so good at. Well, this was the essential insight 
of Adam Smith. The essential insight of the wealth of nations is that trade facilitates specialization. Specialization raises productivity. And so markets allow for specialization, which increases the wealth or the output or the GDP of the economy. No trade, low level of income. High trade, high level of income. Basic advantage of a market system. But the point is that like everything with the markets, output is raised, but not necessarily everybody benefits from that higher income. So instead of that very balanced example that I just gave you, consider an economy that has mostly cropland and only a small amount of land suitable for pastures. If that economy is operating on its own, local beef prices are going to be quite high because there's only a limited amount of land for growing beef. But if that economy opens to trade and world beef prices are lower, the beef will be imported and the corn, which is the comparative advantage of the economy, will be exported to pay for the beef. So that will raise the output of the economy. The economy will be wealthier, but the cattle ranchers who had the advantage of being uh, scarce before trade occurred will be worse off. So this is a simple thought experiment that says, in an economy with very little pasture land, uh, opening that economy to trade will raise the income of the economy, but it will actually lower the income of a specific group within the economy, the cattle ranchers, but it will make the uh, corn growing part of the economy much better off because they get to buy inexpensive meat from world markets. It's an, another simple example of how the market exchange raises output, but doesn't necessarily raise the income of each part of the society. So numerically, it could be something like this. In the economy I'm describing, without trade, the output might be 1,000, with the farmers earning 800 in total and the ranchers earning 200. But with trade, the output might go up to 1,100, the farmer ends up with a thousand and the rancher goes down by 100 to end up with only 100. Should this economy open up to trade? Well, if you look only at the bottom line of economic growth, you say, yes, it's going to make the country richer. We'll go from a thousand to 1100. If you are a rancher, you say, no, please. I don't want the competition of beef products coming from abroad. So the rancher might say no. If the farmer is smart and the rancher has a veto, the farmer would say, let's decide that we're going to go to open trade. I'm going to get a $200 a year bonus to my income but I'm going to give you, rancher, 150 of that increase. So I'm going to end up with 850. Uh, you're going to end up with 250. We're each going to end up $100, uh, $50 richer than we were before. We're going to share the overall increase of output. This, too, is a basic principle. Trade raises output, it shifts the income distribution, it can make some parts of the society absolutely worse off. But the winners in the society, generally speaking, can compensate the losers so that everybody benefits from the change. 
So the principle of trade is that opening an economy to trade, as long as there is compensation to compensate the losers by the winners, there can be a gain for all groups in the economy. So this is a general principle of uh, basic market economics, which is that basic market economics allows you to reach a higher level of income, but it redistributes that income and it can leave some groups absolutely worse off and other groups much better off. And I like to think of it in terms of this diagram, which I hope is helpful for you. On the horizontal axis is the income of one group, call it group one of the society. On the vertical axis is a second part of the society, call it group two. Group one could be low skilled workers. A group one could be cattle ranchers. It depends on the context it depends on the class divisions in the society. An economy might be at the point on the inside of the triangle, the one from which the arrows are emanating. This is an economy of a relatively low level of income of both groups because there's not enough specialization. Uh, the productivity is low. But then market forces enable the economy to reach a higher level of income. It could be a movement in the northeast direction uh, to the new line, which is uh, the maximum income available to the society through trade, for example. And the economic reform could be beneficial for both groups. That's possible. That's what happens if you move in the northeast direction of this diagram. Both group one and group two have a rise of income. But it's also possible that the same economic reform in the first instance leads you in the northwest direction, very much favoring group two, and actually lowering the income of group one, or it could lead in the southeast direction, very much favoring group one, but worsening the income of group two. And so you end up with three possible outcomes after this economic change. All three of those points are a higher GDP. Only the middle point is an improvement for both groups, or what we call a Pareto improvement, meaning that everybody has benefited from the change. But what's really interesting is that whether you end up in the Northwest, the middle, or the Southeast, the winners can compensate the losers so that in the end, both groups benefit from the market reform. And so this is the uh, general principle why markets can be attractive in certain circumstances. I've set aside in the discussion today all the other horrible things that markets can lead to, <laughs> environmental destruction and uh, monopoly power uh, and other kinds of abuses. That comes next week. Here, we're just looking at basic competitive markets. And because of comparative advantage and gains from trade, generally speaking, markets will raise output, but leave some groups farther behind than before. But if the society is both market-oriented and redistributional, then you can take advantage of the marketplace to ensure that all groups benefit. This brings us back to the ideas of pro-sociality and to the ideas of the purpose of government. 
and the nature of social justice. Because maybe John Locke would say, why should you redistribute? That's just what private property did. It made one group worse and the other group better. And that's what a libertarian would say today. Tough luck. Whereas most of the theories of social justice that we have looked at, the universal destination of goods, the idea of altruism, the idea of <coughs> finding uh, uh, a uh, Util, uh, even a, a utilitarian uh, uh, maximization of happiness or happy, uh, greatest happiness for the greatest number would say that redistribution should be part of the solution. That's not a market redistribution. That has to be a government redistribution or a philanthropic redistribution or a civil society redistribution because the market forces alone will lead to the higher inequality. So basic uh, conclusions, markets raise output but also shift the distribution of income. Market economy tends to maximize output but leads to socially conflictual changes in income distribution. Trade plus redistribution generally allows all to gain Trade by itself creates winners and losers. There is a general principle called uh, the first welfare theorem of economics. I'm paraphrasing it uh, very loosely, that when markets are highly competitive, that means there are many buyers and sellers rather than monopolists, and there are no externalities, then market outcomes are what are called Pareto efficient. That means that the market outcome achieves all the potential gains from trade. And if you want to move from that point, you benefit some at the cost of others. So all of these three points on the line are Pareto efficient points. Uh, in the top uh, Northwest, that is a Pareto efficient point, very good for group two and very bad for group one. The point in the middle is pretty much balanced between the two. And the point in the Southeast is very good for group one and very bad for group two, but all three are Pareto efficient. You can't improve both groups well-being from those points. In order to improve the well-being of one of the groups, you have to transfer income or consumption power from the other group. And that may be absolutely the appropriate uh, thing to do. So that's a uh, long uh, way of saying that markets are good, pretty good at making wealth. That was the point that uh, Adam Smith was uh, emphasizing uh, in 1776. That's why his book is called The Wealth of Nations. His book is not called The Fairness of Nations. His book is not called The Justice of Nations. His book is not called The Well-Being of Nations. It's called The Wealth of Nations. And not bad, Adam Smith. You got a lot of it uh, very well uh, put uh, back in 1776 that the uh, forces of market competition can, and the gains from specialization and the benefits of trade can raise wealth, but don't stop there. Remember your social justice, remember the role of government, uh, and then make sure that these benefits are widely shared. But next week, we'll also consider uh, all of the many crucial qualifications, even to the statement that markets maximize the wealth of nations. They tend to have a favorable effect on wealth, but they also can create a tremendous destruction. We see that with the environmental crises. And so we'll talk about externalities next time when what you do causes absolute damage to others, but you don't have to pay for it. 
and that means that the market equilibrium is not going to be an efficient outcome. It's also not going to be a fair outcome. It's going to fail on both of these counts. And that will be the purpose of next week to look at all the ways that markets fail, even on the efficiency, understanding that they absolutely fail on the fairness. They don't even try on the fairness. Uh, that's just not the, uh, the goal of the markets. But they also fail often on the efficiency. So I think we've reached the end of uh, the time uh, today. Uh, we're going to have a review session on uh, the uh, uh, hour exam on Friday. Is that right, Tony? Yeah, we'll do that. We'll use Great. the Friday class as a review session. Yeah. Excellent. And then next uh, Tuesday is the hour exam or next no, Friday? Next Friday. So next Tuesday, oh, you, you do your market failures. And then on Friday, right. we'll have the midterm. Okay, we fail in the markets next Tuesday. See you next Tuesday. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks so much.